Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the Amherstburg Freedom Museum Black History Series presentation titled Researching Black History in Amherstburg Resources at the Marsh Collect Historical Collection. Today's guest speakers are Marsh Historical Collection Collections Coordinator Meg Reiner, Reiner and Collections Assistant Kara Radmore Holkeringa. Uh, Meg has been with the Marsh Collection since April of 2016. She studied history and theory of architecture at Carleton University and has a postgraduate certificate in cultural heritage conservation and management from Fleming College. Meg loves to dig into property research to find out about the people who occupied our historical buildings in Amsburg. And uh, speaking from experience, I have reached out to Meg several times for her, more than several times for her assistance. So we're very grateful to her. Uh, Kara is the collections assistant at the Marsh Collection. She has a BSW from University of Windsor and is currently working on a Master of Library and Information Studies degree from the University of Alberta. She is uh, passionate about local history with a particular focus on genealogy. Uh, so during today's presentation, if everyone could please mute uh, your mic and also turn off your camera, except for our guests, of course, uh, while Meg and Kara are speaking. Uh, following the presentation, there will also be a Q&A, so please write your questions in the comment section, or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you as well. And at this point, you're all welcome to turn your cameras back on. So let's get started, and I will pass it over to Meg and Kara. Turn this part on. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Meg, and this is Kara. <laughs> uh, I would like to start by thanking the Freedom Museum for hosting this presentation. We are very lucky to have the Amherstburg Freedom Museum in our community, and we appreciate all of the work that they do, including organizing events like this one. There have been so many interesting and informative presentations in the Black History series so far, and we are excited to have been given this opportunity to share some of the resources available at the Marsh Collection. So just to give a bit of background on who we are. The Marsh Collection Society was founded in 1983 by John Marsh and his sister Helen Marsh. Their parents, Arthur and Bessie, moved to Amherstburg from Essex in 1900 when Arthur joined the Amherstburg Echo newspaper as secretary treasurer. He was later joined in the business by his son and daughter who continued to operate the Echo until 1981. While Arthur Marsh was at the helm of the Amherstburg Echo, he wisely maintained files on historical events in and around Amherstburg and Essex County. This collection called the Echo Morgue eventually became the centerpiece of what is known today as the Marsh Historical yeah, Collection. The family desired that a facility to house the collection not be opened until after their deaths. The society was officially opened in 1994 on Dalhousie Street and we've since moved over to 80 Richmond Street. The Marsh Collection's mandate is to collect, preserve, and encourage research into the history of Amherstburg and the Lower Detroit River District. Our repository contains a large collection of photos, books, genealogical records, land instruments, maps, and reference files relating to the area. So now we will go into a bit more detail um, on the resources available here that might be of interest to anyone researching Black history. OK, so I'm going to start by talking about some of our genealogy and family history resources that we have at the collection. So we have several cabinets full of genealogy files and they are sorted alphabetically by family name. Listed here are some of the black family names that we have files collected for. And that's not to say that if the name isn't listed there, we don't have any information. We also have miscellaneous files for each letter of the alphabet where we keep information when we don't quite have enough to start a file for the name yet. And we know that the Freedom Museum has been doing an amazing job of compiling family histories on their website. So any families that they've worked on that we also have a file for, we've referenced with a card inside it to uh, correspond to the Freedom Museum uh, page where it's listed. Here's a picture inside the Alexander file to give you an idea of what you might find in the genealogy file here. So this is a document from the Marsh Papers with a few articles from the Amherstburg Echo. One about John Alexander's work on the left hand side and the one next to it is his obituary from 1935. 
So all sorts of information can be found inside these files and it's definitely worth checking out. OK, so anyone who spent any time on genealogy knows that newspaper records are invaluable resources, not only to find birth, marriage and death notices, but also to contextualize ancestors lives and get an idea of what they were up to. So the Amosburg Echo makes up a huge part of our collection. We have the microfilm and original bound copies of each edition from 1874 to 2012. In addition to that, we also have birth, marriage and death indexes pictured here that we purchased from the Ontario Genealogical Society, and these are available in our reference library. These used to, the ECHO used to be digitized um, on a website called INC, but it is down now, so these indexes are going to become more and more helpful to be able to look up these notices. We also have indexes for two columns that were in the Amosburg ECHO, upsetting the hourglass in yesterday's news. These are great resources for contextualizing genealogies, and I'm going to give a little bit more information about how they work on the next slide, but first I'll give an overview of the rest of the newspaper records we have. So in addition to the echo, we also have either bound or in digital format, depending on the year, copies of the Rivertown Times from 1995 to present. And finally, we also have a subscription to newspapers.com, which gives us full access to the Windsor Star from 1893 to present. This is an amazing resource as it's highly searchable and the OCR is easy to pick up uh, search terms. Okay, as I mentioned, here's an example of yesterday's news index in action. So the upsetting the hourglass index would work the same as this. Both columns looked at previous editions of the Echo and republished stories and tidbits as a reminder of the days past. So at the top there is a portion of the 1995 and 1996 yesterday's news index. Each entry shows the name of a person, business, organization, the date it was reprinted in the column in the Echo, the original year it was printed, and a short call, short comment about the entry details. The entries are in alphabetical order. So in the Bs, I found some entries for Homer Brantford and decided to look them up. So the first one appeared in the Echo column on February 7th, 1996, and would have appeared originally in the Echo in 1896, around the same date. So it's usually one or two days off, but this one was actually in the Echo on February 7th, 1896. And I found the reference to Homer Brantford being on the honor roll at the King Street School. And you can see it there on the picture on the bottom left hand side. It's circled. And the second reference listed appears in the Echo on February 26, 1995, but it would have originally been printed in 1915. So it was also February 26, 1915, and it's on the bottom right there. And it discusses how Homer Brantford decided to focus on his boxing career instead of working on the lakes. So I hope this helps show you how newspapers can be such a useful tool in gleaning not just the vital statistics, but also information about the day to day lives of family members. In addition to the files that we have um, of the family records, we also have a large portion of our library dedicated to genealogical reference materials, and some of that is pictured here. I'm going to go over a few different types specifically, but won't have time to cover all of it. So definitely come visit if you're interested in seeing more. So we have many voters lists. The bulk, bulk of them are from Amherstburg for the years 1862 to 1947. In addition to Amherstburg, we have some for varied years for Anderton, Malden, Colchester North and South and Sandwich. On the right is a picture of the first page of the Ward 1 voters list from 1931. It gives a bit of an idea of the kind of information you can find in this. So you can see the name, the occupation, and the lot and street name of the person listed. So it's also very helpful, as you can see, for property history research, which Meg will discuss in more detail. So of course, we also have cemetery indexes, but not just for Amherstburg, we have quite a few for Windsor and Essex County as well. These were originally created by the Ontario Genealogical Society, and again, we purchased for reference here. Shown here is a map of the Rose Hill Cemetery from the beginning of the index. So these maps are really helpful because uh, if you've ever walked in a cemetery, sometimes it's not easy to tell where things are or there's missing markers. So these maps are very useful for being able to figure out what rows are which um, as you get there. 
because the rest of this index will be a transcription of the tombstones uh, by row that are listed here. Lots of directories can also be found in our reference library. We actually have quite a few for Windsor. So the picture on the left, those black spines are for the city of Windsor. We have from 1929 to 1966, with a few later years. The bottom row with the red spines are for the county records, which is mostly the 90s. The second picture on the right hand side shows some earlier gazetteers that cover the Amherstburg and surrounding areas specifically, mostly from the mid to late 1800s. Census records are part of the collection too, covering areas like Maidstone, Colchester, Sandwich, in addition to Amherstburg, Anderton, and Malden. These are mostly late 1800s and early 1900s. An interesting census, excuse me, <coughs> is the census of all children between the ages of 8 and 14 in the town of Amherstburg from 1892. That's shown here on the right hand side. We actually have this census in our rare books collection, the original, but we have a scanned copy available for use in our reading room for anyone who would like to take a look at it. We also have wills. Shown here are portions of the will of Levi Foster. We have many wills from the late 1800s and early 1900s. These can be an interesting source of information, so feel free to come in and check them out or reach out if you'd like us to look one up for you. That brings us to the end of our reference materials that are specific to genealogy, but of course there are genealogy tie-ins to everything in our collection. Moving on to general reference, we'll talk about additional reference materials that might help with more general and topical black history resources. We have a library in our reading room filled with local history books, and we do have a black history section. It's not huge, but we do try to keep it current and one of our more recent additions is a fluid frontier that we found to be a great resource. So any books in our library, including these ones, are available for use during our operating hours. The books that we come back to most often are these, this two volume set created by the Amherstburg Bicentennial Book Committee. It details pretty thoroughly the history of Amherstburg. These could be beneficial in researching black history in this area, as there's a section on Amherstburg's black heritage circled here. These books are also available in our library for use, and there's more sections um, between both books that do cover black history as well. Looking at our topical reference files, uh, we have many files that are arranged by topic, all connecting to the history of Amherstburg. We'll discuss a few here in detail that we think might be relevant. The first are schools. We have a file specifically titled Black Schools, as well as one about the King Street School. It's worth noting that there are files for every Amherstburg school as well, and even some throughout Essex County that might have pictures or information about Black children who attended. Here's a picture from Amherstburg Public School in 1937, for example. Next are our church files. We have one file named Black History Churches Miscellaneous, which speaks to churches throughout Essex County, not just Amherstburg. Of course, we have one for First Baptist Church, the building at 232 George Street. Pictured here is a cover of a large pamphlet taken from the file. Uh, it was for the 150th anniversary of the church in 1986, and it actually has a lot of information about businesses and families uh, who attended the church, as well as some of its history. We have a file for the Mount Beulah Church of God in Christ as well. This church is located at 346 King Street, and it has a really interesting history. So on the left hand side, um, you can see it as the King Street School, which it was before it became the church. That picture is from the Toronto Daily Mail in 1892. On the right hand side, you can see it as the church today. So this property was featured in our newsletters Bricks and Beams column in the fall of 2013. So if you're interested in reading more about the building and how it's changed through the years, definitely check out the newsletter on our website. We have a bit of information for the Mount Pleasant file as well, with additional information in the Black Cemeteries file. The Nazare AME Church also has a pretty substantial file here. There's a few items I took for posted. Uh, the church roll from 1859, 
as well as a program for a choir concert in the 70s. So you can see the materials that we have within these reference files can be pretty diverse. That brings us to the end of our church files, uh, but again, we have many more than this. This is just all that time allowed for today. So I'm going to pass it off to Meg now. So our business binders at the Marsh Collection are organized alphabetically. We are continuously adding to these files, so a business that we have not compiled information on as of today might be added to the list tomorrow. For any of the businesses included in these binders, uh, there might be newspaper articles, advertisements, business cards, photos, copies of invoices, and more. Uh, as a couple of examples, here we have an advertisement for the Twilight Barber Shop on the left there, of which John Gant was the proprietor. And this ad includes a poem from a customer encouraging um, people to stop in and not pass by the shop. And that advertisement is from the Amherstburg Echo in 1878. On the right, uh, we have an advertisement also from the Echo for Foster Brothers Delivery on Apsley Street. And that advertisement is from 1876. We believe the proprietors of Foster and Brothers were George and James, uh, sons of Levi Foster, who succeeded him in the business. We have reference files on local organizations, including the Amherstburg Regular Missionary Baptist Association. In the photo on the left are members with Francis DeBerry, Shakespearean scholar. The photo was taken at the home of Reverend and Mrs. M.C. Davies following a visit to Fort Malden in 1957. And on the right, we also have files on social organizations like Lincoln Lodge, which includes programs and articles about meetings, etc. So on the right side there, we have a photo from our Burt Johnson photo collection of George McCurdy Sr. Um, with his Masonic apron. If you're interested in politics, we have files on municipal history. Information about specific political figures would be found in the genealogy files. So for example, the article on the left um, featuring Howard McCurdy Jr. was found in the McCurdy file here. And on the right, a photo from our photo collection of Mayor Wayne Hurst at the community, Communities in Bloom event in 1998. We do have a separate file for Freedom Seekers and the Underground Railroad. This file contains more general articles published locally over the years, but more specific information about freedom seekers who settled in Amherstburg um, would be located in the individual genealogy files. Emancipation celebrations were often given quite a bit of coverage in the Amherstburg Echo. We have articles about past celebrations, uh, including the event in 1938, which was reported as the largest gathering in a quarter century. 2,500 people gathered at Town Park in Amherstburg. Here is another article from the file about the 45th anniversary event in 1879. Many people arrived by excursion steamer and train to celebrate. The photo at the center on the screen is also from our Burt Johnson collection. Uh, we only have two of the men in the photo identified, Les Conway on the left and Ralph McCurdy as third from the third from the left. So if anyone can help us with identifying the other two men, please let us know. And this photo was likely taken in the 1950s. At the Marsh, we have over 6,000 photos cataloged and many more that have yet to be fully processed. Photocopies of these images are organized according to people, events, organize, organizations, and themes into binders that visitors can come in and look through. Those Were the Days was a feature that ran in the Amherstburg Echo for many years. We have this feature indexed, so if you're looking for a particular person, uh, this is another place you could check for a photo. This is a photo of the Amherstburg Public School circa 1913 to 14 that was published in the Those Were the Days feature. And we had all of the names for the students index so we could pull um, students from the class if you were looking for anyone specific.
We have quite a few resources available for property research at the Marsh Collection. Uh, we have abstracts for the lots in Amherstburg, Anderton, and Malden, which show transactions that took place on a particular property right from the Crown Patent uh, through to the 1950s. Further years are now available online through OnLand, and if you'd like the link to that website, I will share it through chat. Um, OnLand has the abstracts for properties and the transactions go right up to the 1980s, I believe. We have uh, land instruments as well for Amherstburg and Malden, as well as transcribed copies of the instruments for Anderton. Um, these include deeds and mortgages. Uh, the land instruments are very useful even for genealogy because they'll include information like occupation, spouse, and place of residence of the people involved in the land transaction. So for example, at the center of the screen, uh, the indenture there shows a property that was sold to Delos Davis, and it tells us that he was a barrister and at the time of the sale was residing in the town of Amherstburg. We also have assessment rules on microfilm for several years as early as 1812. And these provide information about who owned or even rented a property. Often it tells us their age and the value of the property in addition to other details that vary year to year. So this is an example of a page from the 1863 assessment rule. And as you can see, it lists occupants, um, their profession, occupation, um, it would identify there whether they are a tenant or an owner. Um, so at, towards the bottom there, um, John Brett would be a tenant at, because it lists the owner as uh, Mrs. Benito. And unfortunately on this year, they don't actually provide the age, um, but in some cases they do. So as I said, it varies year to year depending on who was uh, recording the assessments. Our collection of maps and plans can be very helpful for property searches. Often they will show property owners and the frontage of each lot along the street. So in this case here, uh, we have a plan showing property owners along King Street in 1905. A lot of these plans were compiled during sewage or sidewalk construction, sewer or sidewalk construction. And often along with these, there were uh, petitions for completion of the sidewalk, which would have signatures of all the property owners on the street that uh, requested a sidewalk to be put in. So here's an example of a letter from the town's inspector regarding a new sewer on George Street, which lists all of the property owners in 1900. We have quite a few completed property histories here, so if you're interested in a particular address, ask and we might already have something compiled. Doris Gaspar did an extensive study of properties in Amherstburg's downtown, up covering the history up to 1913. The Freedom Museum has a copy of this study as well. In addition to property history, uh, the research also contains quite a bit of genealogical material, including information about early black families in Amherstburg. This on the right here is an example of one of the property studies she did. Uh, 236 George Street was built in 1902 as the parsonage for First Baptist Church, which was located next door on the north. Uh, in addition to Doris's study, we have other properties completed in Amherstburg, Anderton, and Malden. Here's a plan from some research we did on concession nine lot 100 in Malden Township. The Scipio Bell family owned the property from 1875 to 1930. So a few years after Scipio's death, the property was divided among his heirs and we were able to use land instruments from the collection to determine how the property was subdivided and create this plan. And then we use the town of Amherstburg's uh, mapping software uh, because it's useful for comparing current parcel boundaries to how the land was divided at the time. So that's what's shown at the bottom there is the current uh, configuration of the parcels and it matches pretty closely how the land was divided uh, when the Bells owned it. Uh, the town of Amherstburg's mapping site is another link I can provide if anyone's interested. 
Deborah Honor recently brought in her research compiled while looking into Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Amherstburg, or sorry, in Malden. Um, as Kara mentioned, we do have a file with information on Ma Mount Pleasant Cemetery and Deborah Honor's detailed research on the cemetery can be found there. As a result of her study, we now have quite a bit of information that will help with future property research in Malden, such as maps identifying properties owned and occupied by black residents, census and directories. In Anderton Township, uh, we have some information about Marble Village, a settlement that developed in the 1850s on the north side of Texas Road. It was named due to the proximity um, of the settlement to the quarries in Anderton, and the majority of new property owners in Marble Village were black. So uh, actually, I wanted to mention there was a school established there um, in school section number one that was called the Quarry School. So on the right is a plan of property owners in Marble Village. Eleanor Warren and Doris Gaspar have been conducting research relating to properties in Anderton and the families who owned or resided on the property. So this has resulted in information compiled on Anderton families, including uh, the Taylor and Thurman families who occupied concession seven lot two. So the research sheet shown on the left here is an example of uh, some of the research completed by Eleanor. So the sheet would include information about land transactions, census records, and usually includes obituaries and other mentions of the family in the newspaper. So uh, these research sheets are filed according to the family name in the genealogy files. And we're always looking into um, future areas of research. So now that we have um, properties identified in Anderton and Malden Township, uh, we're hoping to conduct further research into those. Uh, we'd also like to expand our business files to include more black owned businesses. And we'd love to hear um, your thoughts on anything you'd like to see from the Marsh Collection, uh, or if you have information or materials that you would like to add to the collection here, um, we would love to to hear about it. So please stop in and visit us. <laughs> Here's our contact information and a panoramic of the office. <laughs> and we're back. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for sharing what is in the Marsh Collection. Um, I, I have several questions I want to ask, but also um, about your collection, but also if any of uh, anyone in the audience, if you have a question, please feel free to type it into the comment section, or you can also raise your hand and um, ask the question directly. Um, if you wanted to turn off, turn on your camera and your mic, that's fine as well too. Um, so while everyone's thinking of questions, um, I'm going to start asking my questions um, <laughs> because it was really informative. Um, I just was hoping um, to just ask a couple of questions, even though it was an incredibly informative pre presentation. So I was just wondering if um, you have an idea of what is your oldest Black history related item in your collection? You'd mentioned assessment rolls that go back to 1812, but would you say it's assessment rolls? Um, it might be assessment rolls. Uh, actually, yes, I'd say for um, property owners, I, the assessment rolls probably go the furthest back. Possibly wills, but our wills here are mainly copies um, of wills that are at the Archives of Ontario. Um, so, although it is possible actually that are the land instruments too, because we do have the original land instruments. So it's very possible that that would be uh, one of our earliest original documents in the collection, but that's an interesting question. So maybe we'll have to look into that. <laughs> no, you answered that's that's a really good answer. Uh, it makes sense that it would deal with uh, with land that it would be among your oldest documents. Um, yeah. I also was wondering as well um, you, when you were talking about the genealogies at the beginning with specific families, um, which one would you say has the most information in it? Can you picture it? My my best guess would be McCurdy, I believe. Yeah, that makes that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Just based on how thick the file yes. is, right? 
Yeah, there is a lot of information that Alvin McCurdy particularly collected. So it, to me, it makes right. total sense that it would be the McCurdy family. Um, I also was wondering, um, are you actively collecting information from the community? And what is your criteria if someone walks in and <coughs> says that they want to donate an item or, um, or document? Yes, um, we're still actively collecting for sure. Um, we receive materials all the time. We just finished going, uh, well, our summer student <laughs> finished going mm -hmm. through a large collection from Amherst, uh, General Amherst. So that includes quite a few class photos, sports photos, um, newspaper articles, that sort of thing. Um, we received another collection last a few weeks ago um, relating to Brunner Mond, uh, that company's oh. photographs. Um, so honestly, anything to do with the history of Amherstburg, Anderton, and Malden um, that we don't already have, uh, we're, we're interested in. And even if someone doesn't want to give us their original materials, uh, we're happy to make copies and put those in our reference files, uh, take scans of photos and give back the originals. We just want to have the information here so that we can share it with the community. That's really good for, for people to know, um, even if they're not comfortable. Of course, I mean, these are treasured possessions, I'm sure, for a lot of families. So even just giving right. you copies of it, I think, is really important for people to know. Um, I was also wondering, do you have a favorite item in your collection? Hmm. Or items? I know you love architecture, Meg, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I don't know. Uh, we do use the red, the, the yeah. bicentennial books quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. Probably our most used yeah, items. Like, look at the spine. It's completely <laughs> off because <laughs> yes. we use it so much. <laughs> so reference material, uh, I'd say it's probably that. Um, we do have some interesting marine items in the collection here, though, that I think are pretty neat. Um, for example, there's a big ship's wheel in the office um, installed yeah. along the wall from the steamer Alaska. Uh, so I think that's pretty interesting because our, our um, this town has a pretty um, significant marine history. So uh, I think it's important that we have those materials here too. And that's Anything something you have I, I enjoy our rare book collection. Some of the, the logs that we have are interesting from businesses because they'll even write information like this person uh, had a baby or this person just passed away from this. So it's, it's interesting. It gives insights that you don't expect from a business log. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, interesting. Um, oftentimes we have this idea of where specific locations for information can be, but um, like advertisements in newspapers can tell you a lot of information about a business owner um, or the, the books you were just talking about as well. Like you might not expect information to be provided in that, but um, it's always nice when you come across it. Um, and also too, Meg, when you were talking about the marine history as well, a lot of times when I'm writing that, researching and writing the family histories uh, for the museum, I come across a lot of, of um, documents, especially in the Echo, talking about mm -hmm. um, black residents who um, were on steamer ships, they were chefs mm -hmm. and, and stewards and things like that. So um, we do have a really rich history uh, marine history um, also within the black community as well too. For um, sure. So a lot if of any people came to Amherstburg for um, to work as mariners. Yes. There were so many job opportunities so. Yes and that that um, basically in, in some instances could dictate where people lived where job opportunities were so that's an excellent point. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question? Well, I do have one more um, before we, we end. If no one, I'm full of questions today, sorry. Um, but it, unless anyone else has any questions. But um, I was wondering if you have uh, military records um, connected to the, the Black community as well. Um, or if not, um, just military records in general. Uh, we have some. I would say if there is any military information it's probably in the genealogy files um okay. you know we do have information about people who served in um the two wars separated out into a separate reference file um for the but for the most part you know if you know of someone who served who was from amsburg anderton or malden we would go to the genealogy file to find information about their service that makes sense yeah 
Um, and for anyone who lives outside of this area, are they able to reach out to you and ask you um, in, for information and then you mail it to them or email it to them? Um, because uh, not everyone lives in Amherstburg, of course. So we want to, if there's options for, for people outside of this area, um, can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. We get requests from people all over, <laughs> lots from the states. Oh, yeah. great. And COVID has really, we had to, We've, uh, you know, often our requests are coming from offsite because mm -hmm. people couldn't come into the office for so long. So, right. yes, we're very used to sending information by email or mail. We want to share it however we can. <laughs> I feel the same way. Um, and we actually have another yeah. question, um, not for me. Um, uh, so uh, it says, mm -hmm. uh, do you ever work side by side with the Freedom Museum on projects? Um, I know for sure that I've reached out to you many times and um, Mary Catherine as well, um, just asking for further information, but I don't know if you had anything you wanted to share. I think I was just going to say that it goes both ways. Um, we ask you for information all the time and then you contact us as well. So I don't know if that counts as a project, but we're always using each other's resources to find information for people. I find when we get uh, genealogy requests, we give what we have, but if it's a black family, we I tend to always refer them to you so that you have a chance to give any input if you have extra information. Yeah, and I mean, from the museum's end, um, we get requests from people um, asking for information and we might have some, um, um, or maybe we have an extensive amount or quite a bit of information, but, um, it's always important to, to reach out to you guys as well, because you might have that little bit of information or that big piece of information that we don't have as well. So, um, so yes, so I, I know I've reached out to you guys many times and, and, and you have as well. So I, I would consider that a collaboration or project as well. Yes, mm -hmm. definite collaboration happening. <laughs> yes. Um, and they said, thank you for that answer. So, <laughs> um, so um, if anyone, does anyone have any other questions? I don't see anyone typing anything in, so um, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts or if you want it, we can just end there. It's up to you. I uh, would just like to say uh, thanks again to the Freedom Museum for hosting us and thank you for everyone who joined in for this presentation. Um, if you have any questions that come up afterwards or you think there is a resource here that you'd like to access, um, call, email, email or stop in. <laughs> And this has been recorded, so it's going to be uploaded to our YouTube uh, page and uh, Facebook and our website as well. So um, if there's any information that you might have missed or wanted to just get a recap on, uh, you can watch it there as well. And thank you again so much for sharing uh, the information and sharing about your collection uh, at the Marsh Collection. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. It's always nice to hear about what's going on with you guys as well. So thank you so much and thank you all for joining us as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>